Hi, I'm Dr. Hart Pinto and we're going to talk today about consent and this is in continuation of our medical ethics lecture series. Okay, so what is consent? Consent is defined as a permission for something to happen or an agreement to do something. In the context of medicine, this involves a patient providing permission or in other words consent for a treatment or an investigation. Gaining consent is the ethical and legal duty of that doctor. Okay, so when a doctor requests consent from a patient, this can be provided either as 1. Written consent, for example, in the case of a consent form for an operation. Oral consent, for example, when we're asking if we can examine a patient. It's imperative, though, that we ensure that this is documented clearly in the notes. And three, uh, implied consent. For example, if we're taking our phlebotomy equipment to the patient and they lean out their arm for us to take their blood. Ideally, this should be avoided where possible, as it may be misinterpreted by the doctor. We should also note that written consent is the most legally substantiated and implied consent is the least legally substantiated. So why is consent important? All persons have a legal right to preserve their body integrity. If consent is not obtained by a doctor, they would violate this legal right and therefore could be sued for battery against that patient. A doctor who does this would be seen as medically negligent and could, in theory, be sued or brought in front of the General Medical Council and their clinical practice questioned. Consent is also important because it maintains a good doctor-patient relationship it increases the trust between patients and all doctors of the medical profession. And a virtuous doctor would seek to obtain consent prior to performing any examination or treatment. Patients can refuse to give consent. The law permits that a competent adult has a right to refuse even life-saving treatment. Even if the doctor determines this is not in the best interests, the patient's wishes must be respected. Patients also have the right, even after providing consent for a treatment or procedure, they have the right to withdraw that consent at any time. For example, a patient undergoing an appendicectomy, which may even be life-saving, the patient can withdraw their consent for that operation even as they are about to be anaesthetised. Doctors in that circumstance would need to reevaluate the situation, rediscuss the benefits and risks of not proceeding with the operation, and should the patient make the informed decision that they don't want to proceed, their wishes again must be respected. Moving on now. So there are three criteria that must be fulfilled in order for consent to be valid. Firstly, a patient must be fully informed about the treatment, benefits, the risks. They must also be competent to provide consent. And consent itself must be provided voluntarily without coercion. So first of all looking at informed consent, in order for a patient to provide valid consent they must be fully informed of the following. The nature of the treatment and investigation being proposed, why that treatment or investigation is required, how the procedure will be performed, the risks and benefits of the procedure, including the possible side effects, 
alternative treatments that are available and the likely success of the treatment or investigation being performed. Competency for consent is a slightly more difficult concept to understand. Only a competent adult can provide valid consent. Where the patient is not competent, they must be treated in their best interests, using the ethical principle of beneficence. Family members have no legal right to provide consent for incompetent adults, but their views should be considered. Patients greater than 18 years are legally determined to be competent adults, unless proven otherwise. Children greater than 16 years have presumed capacity for consent. Children less than 16 years are presumed not to have capacity for consent, unless this can be proven by the doctor using Gillick competence and Fraser guidelines. We will discuss this later on. So how do we determine if a patient is competent to provide consent? A patient must be able to understand the relevant information being provided, be able to retain that information for long enough to weigh up the pros and cons of the procedure or treatment being proposed and make an informed decision being able to communicate that to the doctor either by talking, signing or in writing. Consent must be provided voluntarily without any undue coercion. They must not be influenced by the doctor or the family. Doctors are solely present to advise and provide the relevant and required information. This allows the respect of a patient's autonomy. So now let's look at some special circumstances where consent may be problematic. So doctors can provide treatment to patients without consent, but only in the following circumstances. In emergency situations with an incompetent adult, where patients may be mentally ill, and children less than the age of 16 years. So where emergency life-saving treatment is required for an incompetent adult, doctors should assess the patient's capacity and document their findings clearly in the patient's notes. They must act in the best interest of the patient, i.e. to prevent significant deterioration or provide life-saving treatment. They must identify if there is a clear, valid refusal of treatment that exists, such as an advanced directive against CPR. So if a patient came in with a cardiac arrest uh, into our A&E department and they had a community DNA CPR, we must respect that previous decision and not perform cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Where a patient has a legal guardian, this person should be consulted. In reality, it's always good practice to discuss these matters with the next of kin and other relatives and friends. Where patients are mentally ill, this is covered by the Mental Health Act. Urgent treatment can be provided, acting in the patient's best interests, where... One, a treatment is required to save the patient's life. Two, the treatment prevents a serious deterioration in the patient. Three, it reduces serious suffering. Or four, the patients are in danger of self-harm or harm to others. Consent in children is somewhat complicated. We know that at 18 years, a patient is legally considered an adult and therefore no person has the right to provide consent on behalf of them. For children less than 18 years, a parent or legal guardian has the right to provide consent. Parents or legal guardians 
must act in the patient's best interests. Where they don't, doctors may seek to obtain a court order to proceed with treatment. In these cases, a doctor should seek advice from the hospital legal team. For children aged 16 to 17 years, they have presumed capacity for consent. Their circumstances are slightly different in that they are able to provide consent for treatment, but they cannot refuse it. And where they do refuse it, an adult who has a parental or guardianship over that person can provide consent on their behalf. For children under 16 years, under Gillick Competency and Fraser Guidelines, they can legally provide consent. But in order to do this, the doctor must be 100% satisfied that the child understands the treatment and can provide valid consent. Again, the child cannot refuse treatment and the parent cannot overrule their child's wishes unless the child refuses the treatment, in which case, again, the adult can provide consent on behalf of the child. So realistically, a child can provide consent and where that consent is provided, their parent cannot withdraw the consent. But where that child refuses to provide consent, the parent or legal guardian has the right to overrule that and provide consent on the child's behalf. Here I have listed some suggested further reading topics, including the GMC's uh, consent guidance, the Mental Health Act of 2007, which we will cover in another subsequent lecture, and the Mental Capacity Act, all of which are relevant to the topics considered here. Thank you for listening to this lecture. Should you have any questions or any comments, please leave them in the section down below. And don't forget to subscribe for more ethical and medical lectures to come.